Well, good morning. And good morning to those listening online. Today we're picking it up in, uh, man, I just, I gotta go back. I just, the time, and worship, just when God shows up and it's just you and him and it's just us and him and it's like, it just, it's all we need. All we need. You know, I wasn't, uh, wasn't, last song came on and I wasn't ready to get up and teach and just wanted, wanted and needed more time, needed more time with the Lord. And I think the last song that we listened to was better than the last one that I had picked. And God just uh, really ministered and, you know, so we really just stay dependent on Him no matter what. That when we leave His presence, we should be just as dependent on Him as we are in His presence. Uh, and this morning we're looking at Genesis 29 and we see that Jacob sort of leaves God's presence. We remember that last week that he was blessed. He was told to leave. He was blessed by his parents and charged to find a wife uh, in the hometown of his mom, <coughs> which was quite a bit away. Remember Esau tried to compensate and find himself another wife too. Uh, but that as Jacob lays down to sleep on a rock, And as he's sleeping, God gives him this vision, this dream of the ladder, the stairway from earth to heaven with the angels going up and down and God is at the top. Remember that when he wakes up, he goes, surely God was in this place. And they didn't know it. And he makes this vow that if God does all these things for me when I get back here, that uh, then I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll give my life to him, so to speak. So he's seeing God face to face and he's still not ready for that commitment. I think a lot of us can understand that. I remember before getting... Uh, truly saved, that I knew who God was, uh, but I hadn't yet made that commitment. I would cry out when I needed something, but would go right back to my ways until the day that I finally gave my life to him. And isn't he patient? But God had already promised Jacob these things. Jacob didn't need to put him to the test. He could have trusted him there. God was ready and willing and waiting. And are there things that God has promised you that you're waiting for to come true before you believe him? This morning we're going to look at an interesting and a, a sad story, uh, and we'll see how God uses it. But man, are you ready and now to receive the things God has for you, or do you have to let more trials and tribulations come your way before you're ready to bow the knee to Him? And God, this morning we pray that you would help us bow our knees and our hearts to you, that God, you would be the one who's got the rightful place in our lives, and that you'd be the one who would have your way the things that you promised each of us god do you have promises for us even just straight up in the scripture that you have uh plans to prosper us and not harm us give us a hope in the future as it's on the wall in front of me god you use that to remind me that lord these things are for us too that you have specific plans and purposes for each of us god help us to trust you now in them and not put you to the test but in a sense lord let your promises be put to the test that we might find joy as we believe them and they come true because it's you're the one who is the promise who's making them come true we pray that you would speak to us in your word this morning and just have your way lord we love you and uh, want to lift you up in your word that all men might come to you in jesus name amen so let's pick it up in genesis 29 and we're going to read the first 14 verses together uh, to start it says so jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east and he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. And they rolled the stone from the well's mouth. And then we water the sheep. Now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. 
And Jacob told Rachel that he was his father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. We see here in this first verse where we get the title for the message that Jacob went on his journey. That Jacob went from that place. He left his fathers and mothers. He traveled northward from where they were in the south by Egypt all the way up northward to Haran. If you remember, Haran is where Abraham had stopped on his way out of Ur. It's up by the Tigris and Euphrates in modern day Syria, uh, close to Iraq. But he went up on his journey. And he continued on. He left this place of uh, meeting with the Lord and he went on and we'll see that <coughs> he's going to fall in love and that things are going to happen to him. But that he, uh, in some sense, we don't see this story we're going to see today of him and God. We're going to see God's uh, interaction with someone else in the story today. But as a note on Syria, we should keep our eye on it in modern days. Isaiah 17 one says, The burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and will be a ruinous heap. And all throughout uh, Syria, uh, Damascus' existence throughout history, it has never ceased being a city. There's lots of cities that pop up, that disappear, that maybe get revived, or there's ghost towns out in the west uh, where there was gold or another rush, and then the rush went away, and then that went away. There's many ancient cities that don't exist anymore or that have had new cities put up on top of them, but not so with Damascus. And yet today we see a lot of fighting happening in Damascus. We see the world powers converging on Damascus. Russia, Iran, China, ISIS, the United States, Europe, all converging over here, east and west. Uh, and it's interesting to see that this prophecy could be uh, come true in our day. And perhaps this will be a part of the end times. But just to keep an eye on that area, it's a part of the clock, I believe. But he goes to the land of the people of the east. You know, that these people that he ends up finding were the same people that uh, his mom and his grandfather Abraham. Uh, you know, God was really moving in this people. God keeps bringing, uh, he brought Abraham out. And he keeps bringing his descendants back there to interact with these people and to have a hand on their lives. And he's really moving in this family, in this region. Again, you know, Israel became a nation, but he took people out of other nations to make this new nation. And talk about a journey, about Jacob continuing and going on his journey. Remember, there's no GPS. There were no paved roads. You know, obviously they had paths and roadways. They had, you know, ways to figure it out. Even out here, uh, you know, in the Western United States, there would be a lot of uh, paths that the Native Americans used that still exist today, even though they're walked and, uh, you know, certain hiking trails and then follow them. You know, that there were roadways in a sense, just not in the way we think of them. But again, you know, there's no five and dime on the corner. <laughs> there's no Interstate 90. Uh, so how many people along the way had Jacob asked, you know, hey, uh, where am I? Where exactly am I? I've been walking for a couple weeks. Uh, where am I? You know, you might kind of uh, want to check your directions there. But <clears throat> these guys are the people that he's been looking for. He's in the right space now. They're, they're from Haran or Haran. And they're, they know of his family there. But they're at this well. They've gathered their sheep. It's the middle of the day. It's hot. Again, I think of the well and the people who go there uh, wouldn't go in the middle of the day, but it's hot. But they have this big stone in front of it. It's probably due to maybe land rights. Maybe it was Rachel's well and they had to wait, or Laban's well, they had to wait for him to get permission to use it. Perhaps it's because it's so hot. You know, this is Syria, Iraq, Euphrates. It's hot up there. Uh, they cover this well to keep it from drying up. Um, I'm not sure, but they were here waiting for it to be open that they could feed, uh, well, water their flocks. You know, this is a good place to meet people in the area. You know, if you want to meet people, you generally don't go walking out in the middle of the woods. You go into town. You know, you want to you get to talk to a shop owner. You meet someone at the store. Uh, and that's kind of the place he's at now. He found a good place to figure out where he's going and, uh, and if they know anybody. But uh, Haran, great. This is great. He's in the right place. He's come all this way, and he's in the right area. He hasn't gone too far to the left or the right. He's gone right to Haran. And he says, Laban. And then they answer, we know him. 
Now, I can't read into the scripture. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. <clears throat> I didn't see anything in the one commentary I looked at. But I wonder if these guys know Laban. We know what, what we have the benefit of hindsight, so we know who Laban is and what kind of character he has. But I wonder what kind of answer they gave him. They said, yeah, <laughs> we know him. And maybe Jacob doesn't pick up on it. Or maybe they're like, yeah, we know him. Or of course we know him. He's Laban. He's rich. He's got all this stuff over there. How can we not know him? I don't know how they answered him there. But they answered him. They knew him. And that was good. He was on the right path. And we see that, oh, yeah, here's his daughter. You know, speak to the devil, so to speak, as they say. Here comes Rachel coming on down with the sheep. And to me, I, you know, again, I'm not a cultural expert, but I don't really see too many women being shepherds, at least back in the day. This was sort of a man, a boy's job. This is a sense like a dirty, smelly job. We're out with them all day. We see David was a shepherd. Uh, his brothers, Joseph and his brothers were out with the flocks. We don't see the sisters out there, but Rachel is out doing this. Um, and she's a shepherdess. So she's a capable young girl to be out here doing this. I don't know exactly how old she was, but she's out here doing this and, uh, and capable of it, so much so that they, they see her coming. Um, and he hasn't quite seen her yet. He just knows that this is a girl. This is Laban's daughter. Jacob's coming up here to get married. All these other shepherd guys are hanging around and they say, yeah, here comes Rachel right now. And we know from the scripture that she was a beautiful girl. So I'm sure all these guys thought she was beautiful. And like, hey, Rachel's coming. And so what does Jacob do? He says, hey, hey, isn't it? It's still in the middle of the day. Why don't you guys go feed your sheep and come back a little later when they open the well? Go, you, we don't need to hang out here. And they go, no, 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 we're not going anywhere. We're waiting for the water to be open, and then we're going to do it. But this is a typical guy move. He's coming up here to find his bride. Here comes a lady from the family, and all the other guys know her. And he goes, I'm going to try and get rid of the competition right here. Good old Jacob, up to his ways of deceiving and trying and tricking and trying and get it to work in his favor. Uh, but they don't really go along with him. They don't, they don't get up and leave. They don't, they, they don't buy it. They're not budging. Uh, so when he does see her, he sees that she's beautiful and she's, you know, obviously got these sheep and his family, obviously Laban's rich. So what's his next guy move? Well, I'm going to roll the stone away. Oh, look at me. I'm Jacob. I'm rolling the stone away for you, Rachel. Look at how buff my arms are. Even though I've been dwelling in tents, I'm not like my brother Esau, but I can roll the stone away for you. Here, let me help you with that. Let me get that for you. Let me help you with your groceries, ma'am. Man, another guy move. You know, what, what a guy won't do to impress a pretty lady. Um, again, you know, uh, again, I think about when uh, I first met my wife and started her car for her after church or made sure that she was comfortable, you know, after we had known each other. This wasn't the first time she showed up. This is after we kind of been talking for a little while. <laughs> and I was, you know, starting to consider her in that way but there are other guys around i want to make sure that i was the one to do it i'm not going to let them step in and 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 uh be the big brother for her um but man he's tr he's really trying to impress her here but i think he was also relieved and overjoyed to have found his family he had come this long way he'd been kicked out at least he's finally going in the right way here and i think it's interesting how this is similar to how uh, Eliezer found Rebecca for, for Isaac at the well. That he had gone up to the same area, was at a well, and that uh, uh, she was coming out in the right place. But he's excited, he finds her, and uh, he's, he's going the right way. You know, I think that this is confirmation for him that this is the right place, the right family. Not only does he just show up here, is at a well, the right area, but oh, Right at that very moment, here comes uh, Rachel down the path with the sheep. You know, these were all of his relatives. He was willing to serve there. You know, he begins to uh, roll that stone for whatever motives he's doing. At least, you know, he's already starting to show that he's willing to work. I remember praying and asking uh, God if Ashley was the right one, and God answering me that. You know, there's times we need to ask God about where we have places to serve, and where do we go, and what do we do, Lord? And uh, we begin to get confirmations of those things. God will confirm those things. I don't mean signs and wonders. 
That's when you start praying about something and it starts becoming obvious that's the right way to do. Things begin to fall into place. God will even give you an answer in Scripture. But as a side note, let's look at Mark 16, 14 through 20. It says, Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. You see that Paul and the apostles do that. They will speak with new tongues. They speak very much in Acts. We see that. that we get, they speak in tongues. It says they will take up servants. Remember Paul stick, gets the wood on the island and he gets bitten. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Peter, Paul, etc. healed many. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. You know, when God works, there's clear evidence. That doesn't mean that we go out and get snakes and handle them to try and prove this true. But what it's saying is that as we follow God, as we go out and do the things of God, amazing things are going to happen. That God is going to confirm his word with signs and wonders. And that doesn't mean that the signs and wonders are what we trust in. But hey, as we begin to share God's word and live a life for him, things are going to happen that are going to prove that we're really living for him, that it is really him leading and guiding. And if it doesn't, well, after a while, you begin to consider, well, am I really doing what God wants me to do? And that's why it's important to pray. But we know that there is clear evidence that God is working, but it's not always the evidence we expect. We'll see here today, we expect to see God being the one in working in Jacob's life, and he is, but we'll see that God is really working in someone else's life in this chapter. Because when God works, again, there's clear evidence. But when man works, it's empty. And the real evidence that God is working is that there's fruit that remains. Because when man works, things get popular. There's fads all the time. Popular movies, popular books, popular things. But then in a year or two, no one wants them anymore. No, you still listen to that song? What are you wearing that for? That's all last year. These things fade and they're empty and it's all vanity. But Jesus says in John 15, 16, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And as we begin to follow the Lord and continue to do so, he's going to make fruit that lasts and remains in our lives. There's going to be a change in your life that, yeah, you may stumble and falter at times, but that change is going to grow and remain no matter where you go, no matter how far you go in life. You're going to be that changed person. It's not like you're going to get into being a Christian for a year or two and then stop. Well, then there isn't lasting fruit. Then it wasn't really a work of God. Then perhaps your heart wasn't prepared as it should have been. I pray that you let your heart be prepared. Let your heart be good soil and desire to be that God might bear fruit in you and that you might not wither out and die. But it says that Jacob kissed Rachel. He didn't even say hi to her, the scripture says. I mean, maybe he said, hi, I'm Jacob. But as you read the, the scripture, it just says that she shows up at the well and this guy rolls away the stone and kisses her. Uh, today, he'd end up in the news. He'd be fired from his job. He'd be banned from all social media and probably rightly so in some sense. Uh, but in another sense, it makes a lot of sense here. Especially with the cultural kissing, you know, in Europe and the Middle East, when you kiss on the cheeks, this is a greeting. Um, still goes on to this day. First Corinthians sixteen twenty talks about all the brethren greet you, greet you another with a holy kiss. Uh, and I think in a sense that's what this was. He wasn't being rude. He was overjoyed. Think about all that he'd come out of, and as far as he traveled by himself, and he's here. And the minute he shows up, he's looking for a wife. This beautiful girl shows up, and it's in his family. She's in his family. But he tells her what's going on, what the story is, who he is, that they're family. She runs back to tell her dad. And Laban is overjoyed as well. Laban kisses him, invites him home. They have food. And it says that uh, he told Laban all these things in the end of verse 13. I wonder what he told him. I wonder how far back Jacob went and what exactly details he put in, what, exactly detail, what exact details he left out. Did he just say, my mom sent me here to find a wife? Or did he say... You know, we had some family problems. I had to run away. We don't, you know, I, I don't know that he was totally honest, but I'm sure he told him enough because Laban says, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. 
And maybe he said that without even realizing just how deceptive they both are. Just how they really are cut from the same deceptive cloth. You know, was Laban identifying with Jacob's craftiness? Or just simply that he was family? And I think that this meeting is special and it's a good time for them. And they are indeed excited. Excuse me. Let's go on. Let's read verse 15 through 20. It says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, and so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob stayed, served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Oh. <laughs> only a few days for seven years. Man, I, time does fly. The time between meeting Ashley and getting married was, was a blur and was a Zoom and was great. But the fact is, it was like, oh, I can't wait for that day. And a time to seem fast. At times it seemed slow, like it would never come, but it came fast. I look back now, we're almost at seven years of being married, and that was fast because I love her. And she's fantastic. But basically, Laban says here, the vacation's over, Jacob. Let's get down to business. You've been here a month. It's time, you know, if you're going to stay on, you got to start working. And I guess I, I got to start paying you. So if you're going to stay here, you got to work. You can't mooch off me. And I can't give you this favor that I wouldn't give to my own sons. You know, my own family would have to work too. And this is, makes sense. You know, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 to 13 says, For when we are with you, we command you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now those who are such, we command you and exhort you through our Lord Jesus Christ, that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. That, man, we need to work. As Christians, if we're hungry, if we need something, get a job, get a second job, do what it takes. But he says, what should your wages be? And I, I think Laban knew what Jacob wanted. I Laban knew that Jacob wasn't there to get a job. Jacob wasn't there to set up shop. Jacob was there to find a bride. And so knowing Laban, this was his dealing. All right, you want to marry one of my daughters? I know who it is. You know, parents kind of pick this stuff up. But what should your wages be? All right, well, you're not getting her for free, buddy boy. You're going to work for her, so tell me about it. Again, this is such a loaded question. We see the true colors of Laban begin to sneak out now when the rubber hits the road. And he's going to have to go to work. And the Bible says, well, Laban had two daughters. And the first was named Leah. And her name means weary or wearied. You know, Leah sounds like such a beautiful name. And then you get to know what it means, wearied. <laughs> Thankfully, you, would, you know, come here, weary. Eh, I don't know. Perhaps the pregnancy wore out her mom. Or that she, they saw her, she looked tired. Or they wearied her. You know, her, her, she wasn't beautiful to behold. The scripture is sort of alluding to. So when you looked at it, it wasn't like, ha, ah. Okay, it was kind of a, a struggle a uh, pain to, to look at her even, perhaps. A burden to look at her. It says that her eyes were delicate and tender, soft or weak. Maybe she wore the Coke bottle glasses. She couldn't see very well. Maybe that's all she had going for her was her eyes. You know, maybe that name did have to do with how she looked. She wasn't a sight for sore eyes. She was a sight with sore eyes. And perhaps not having that physical beauty will see her inward beauty shine. But, you know, we place far too much emphasis on outward beauty, especially when picking a mate. Thankfully, my wife had very low standards with outward beauty when she married me. Uh, and thankfully, I had very high standards when I married her. <laughs> She's beautiful and I'm not. And you look, how does that work? It usually works that way. It doesn't usually work the other way. But Rachel, her name means you, like a lamb, like a sheep. It's interesting that she becomes a shepherdess. She's really living up to her name here. And you think a pretty girl wouldn't want to get muddy and be out with the smelly animals all day. But Rachel did. 
It's a day, you know, uh, my oldest daughter, me and I took a walk the other day and we're walking in the mud. It's like, oh, mud, it's gooey. I don't like it. You know, I'm a girl. I don't have to like this. And oh, it smells like poop. And, you know, it's like, I mean, yeah, it's, I get it. Hey, but <laughs> let's talk about something else on the walk to the mailbox. But my daughter is very girly and that's awesome. And that's special. Uh, and she's very beautiful. But this Rachel was beautiful and had no problem getting muddy. Uh, where does it say? Be she was beautiful in form and appearance. That not only was she beautiful to look at, but her form was, you know, she was strong perhaps. Obviously, she's out with uh, the animals. The way she carries herself was beautiful. She was a, she was a strong person. Proverbs 31, 17 says she girds herself with strength and she strengthens her arms. That this Rachel was fit, she was beautiful, and she was capable, and she had a head on her shoulders to be able to handle all these things. Uh, and that is a very powerful combination uh, to have a woman with that. You know, to have uh, a woman can be very convincing when she's beautiful. A guy shows up and you may not buy it, but a, a beautiful girl shows up and she tries to sell you something, maybe you will buy it, right? But Jacob loved her. You know, perhaps this was love at first sight. This word can mean all sorts of love, but it doesn't necessarily carry the connotation of lust here. He, I believe he really did love this girl as much as a man of the world can. She was young, beautiful, capable, capable, hardworking. How could he not? He's looking for a wife. This woman seems to fit all the bill. He wasn't the outdoor guy. She seems to be the outdoor type with the sheep. So perhaps they were an odd couple. But you know what? It was love. It was love. But Jacob, somewhere along the line from when he left home to here, lost all of his negotiating skills. He got swept off his feet by Rachel, and right off the bat, when he says his wages, he says, seven years. Did you have to do seven years? Could you start a little bit lower? I mean, definitely low ball, not to the point where you're going to make Rachel think you don't care about her at all. She's only worth a weekend of labor. But man, love is a powerful thing. And to quote Huey Lewis, The Power of Love, the song goes, The power of love is a curious thing. It makes one man weep, makes another man sing. Change a hawk to a little white dove, more than a feeling. That's the power of love. We saw, what do we see? We saw Jacob show up. He meets her. He kisses her. He weeps and cries out. This deceiver, this guy who's conniving, oh, yeah, head over heels. The man who is uh, able to sneak and trick on his dad, Seven years, leaving whatever you want. Because he's in love with this girl. Totally sounds to me like Jacob was head over, head over heels. Didn't have to prove it with seven years. You could have started with a year or two, maybe. And people get married in life a lot faster than seven years. He didn't need to wait seven years to prove himself to her or her to him. People get married in a couple of years sometimes. In fact, I think common law, I don't know if it's, all over the place, but something about common law marriages after seven years. But maybe he knew because she was the younger and maybe he was trying to sweeten the deal. Maybe he wasn't as naive as it seems to be from one angle. Maybe he was trying to give time for Leah to get married off because he says, I'll, I'll work seven years for you to marry your younger daughter, Rachel, making it very clear I don't want to marry your older daughter, making it very clear I understand you got to marry Leah off first, so maybe seven years is enough time to to, to get this, uh, <laughs> this other one married off that I don't even want to look at. And Laban says, as a good loving father, sure, it's better to give her to you than to someone else. Thanks a lot, Dad. <laughs> Appreciate it, Laban. But says that Jacob served those seven years. He worked. He worked hard. It didn't seem long because he truly loved Rachel. That deceiver that heel catcher had finally found something in someone worth living for and for serving for love. It's funny. You see this guy who's conniving and he's got this great capacity to love and, and serve for her. And those seven years seem like, but a few days it said, in fact, they call it a week later on. You know, I don't know about any seven years. It feels like a week other than being married to my wife. Like I said earlier that it's been a blur, but it's been a good blur and I love it. I love her. Let's go on and read verses 21 through 30. It says, Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are filled, that I may go into her. 
And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And so he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. And Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as a maid. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and served with Laban still another seven years. So in these few verses, we see 21 years go by. But he says, give me my wife. Seven years, just now, the clock struck midnight. It's time to have my wife. Not very romantic, he says, because I want to be with her. I, so I assume that, you know, they knew each other through a time. They talked to each other. It's not like they didn't see each other or, you know, have din family dinner together or go for walks or anything. But he didn't yet have that intimate relationship with her. He's like, it's been seven years. Time's up. Let's go. Let's get married. I've served you. I've done the work. <laughs> Pay up. Again, I don't think Laban had this marked on his calendar. I'm sure Laban was like, oh, Jacob, come in. What do you want today? <laughs> you know, what can I do for you today? I don't think he really cared. He, he was more concerned about doing things done the way he wanted them and getting these girls. He knew Rachel would get married off eventually, but he knew Leah wouldn't. So he wanted to get these girls out of his house and get them to be someone else's uh, responsibility, so to speak. Although he does try and get them back later. You see this, I don't know about this relationship with his dad and his daughters where uh, they're just worth labor to him. There's some bargaining chip for him to get a hired hand. Um, but Laban gives Leah. He goes, well, Jacob, you know, you only say which wife. He just said, give me my wife. I got to marry the first one. And, and how do you confuse this? How much drinking was done in that feast that night? How dark was it in his tent? Did he not say, Rachel, I love you? Or did he just go right in and, and that was it? Was Rachel not there? Where was she during this wedding and this feast? Was she locked up in the tower like Rapunzel? There were so many shady things going on in this just few verses. Uh, let's say a lot. You know, Hosea 8, 7a says, They sow to the wind and reap to the whirlwind. That Jacob had worked for seven years, hard and honest worked, but his life of deceit had caught up with him. He had missed the boat on this one. All his deceit was now coming right back in his face. He had let his guard down, and the trickster was now the tricked. He says, Why have you deceived me? Didn't that work for you? Didn't I keep the deal for you? Am I not family? Was it not specifically for Rachel? How could you mix this up? I know you did this on purpose. You went through this whole thing going, I know he wants Rachel. I've seen you two talk. I've seen you never talk to Leah. There's no way this is an accident. Why did you do this to me? We agreed on it seven years ago. Again, just a, a side note that seven's the year, the number of perfection and completeness in the Bible. He says, okay, all right, okay, you're right, but we have to do this. It's just what we do around here. This, you can tell this, this answer that I think would infuriate anyone with this. But he says, you know what, serve for me another seven years. Give me, let me get another seven years work for you. Um, all he gets out of this deal is a wife. He doesn't have money in the bank. He doesn't have a 401k. Yeah, he gets food and shelter for those seven years, but he doesn't walk away with anything else but a wife. So imagine working seven years for somebody and it's not the right person. And having to work another seven years, and you still don't have any a dime to your name. I'd be fuming. I've been ripped off before in life, and, and I've been fuming, but I've never worked seven years. Well, actually, almost seven years goes by, and then I get ripped off in a way. But, you know, the Lord is my vengeance, and he takes care of me. But how does Leah feel this moment? I mean, she's the one. I'm going to use our Western metaphors of marriage because we can rely on it, and I'm not so closely familiar with ancient Syria. But she gets all dressed up. She's got the white dress on. They put the veil on. They get her bridesmaid, so to speak. They do all the wedding planning. They get the feast going. And she knows that Jacob loves Rachel. She knows that it's been seven years that he's been working there. It's no secret. She knows she's never had a caller at her doorstep to work seven years for her. 
She knew the deal that Jacob had with her dad. And she's the one wearing the dress. She's the one walked down the aisle, so to speak. She's the one who was wrapped up in the arms of Jacob's love that night. Had to have known that it wasn't for her. Does she like Jacob? Does she perhaps have a crush on him, so to speak? And I mean, we see that she cares about him later and wonders what, what he thinks and cares about her and wants her to love him, but it's just a sad situation. You know, where is this girl mentally, spiritually, emotionally? She had been wearied out so long in life that she's willing to go along with this. She's willing to be sold off for some trickery of her dad. And man, does a weary person settle for whatever they can get And a weary person really begins to think that this is all that they're worth. When, as we'll see, they're worth so much more. But this is Leah. She goes, I'm I'm ugly. No one likes me. My dad just tricked me. But you know what? I like Jacob. He's a good guy. He's family. Uh, I'll get married to him. Maybe Maybe he'll learn to love me. Maybe he'll change. Maybe he'll like me eventually. This is all I can get anyway. How tragic for her. I don't really care about Jacob getting ripped off in light of Leah at this moment. Think about how she's feeling and what her state is. And this family, it's messed up. Everything we've been reading is messed up. But look at how interested God is in them. All these situations, yet God keeps putting waypoints on the map for them spiritually and historically for them to get to the Messiah ever since the garden all the way here. Here, you just get to this point. Jacob, I'm here. Believe in me. All right. Well, I'll be here when you get back, Jacob. They just spend these times between these waypoints in the strangest and the least loving places. And they don't have to, but they haven't yet come to God. They haven't yet submitted to God. They haven't yet been joined to God. We see one more verse, and that's seven more years. Think about all the times in those seven years that he was thinking about this, living with this. How with every swing of Jacob's arms and his labor, every bringing in of the the sheep and bringing them back out, bringing the goats in, bringing the livestock in. I served seven years already. I have to serve seven more. Can't Laban rip me off? I have to go home to Leah? I don't want to go home to Leah. Maybe he worked extra late every night because he didn't want to go home. Leah every day, washing the dishes, so to speak. Oh, maybe he'll come home today. Maybe he'll want to have dinner with me today. Maybe he'll say more to hello to me than when he comes in, knowing that he only married her because her dad tricked him. And when Jacob and Rachel get married, is there a feast? I hope so. It doesn't really say. I would assume so. That's how this worked. But Jacob loved Rachel far more than Leah, no doubt. Scripture even says that she was hated. And he served seven more years. And he was content to stay in that situation. And again, he worked seven years for Leah. That's all he got out of the deal. He worked seven more years against Rachel. That's all he gets out of the deal. I mean, that's fantastic. It's not, you know, you get married, it's wonderful, but he doesn't have money. He doesn't have a car. He doesn't have a house. He doesn't have possessions. He doesn't have his own flocks. We'll see that in a later chapter, how God handles that. But man, this is an interesting life. And he's probably older at this point, too. We know that he wasn't a spring chicken when he headed out here. Uh, His brother being older when he was married already. You know, they're still dependent on Laban to some degree. And let's go on to verse 31. It says, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I had borne him three sons, and therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. We see in this very next verse 
it says that Leah was unloved, and if we look at other translations, it says even hated. But that the Lord saw it. That through all this, God wasn't absent. Through the deceiving, the conniving, the 14 years up to this marriage, God was there. God was looking at this family. God was looking at Leah. And the message is titled, Jacob Went on His Journey. Because we're following Jacob in this area of Scripture, it's his path in life, so to speak. But if we focus on what the Lord is specifically doing in this chapter, the Lord is looking at Leah. He's looking at the one with weary eyes. And the Lord doesn't grow weary or faint. He's looking at the one who causes the weary eyes, but it doesn't wear him out. God is looking steadily upon this one who no one would give a second glance to. God would bring her a husband and use her to mother several tribes of the great, greatest nation in my estimation in history. Did she cry out to God at this point? I don't know specifically. It doesn't necessarily say that. But what it does say is that the Lord saw that she was hated. That her husband hated her. But he was still doing the husbandly duty with her. And he opened her womb. He opened her womb. Perhaps her, she was, would have been barren too if God wasn't looking at her. She was unloved by Jacob, but she was loved greatly by the Lord. And God opened her womb, but he did not open Rachel's. Rachel remained barren. And again, this seems to be a family issue. Perhaps again, Leah would have been effective if the Lord wasn't looking at her. But we see Sarah was, was barren until old age. Rebecca, they had to pray and God opened their womb. And now Rachel as well. She's younger, she's fit, she's beautiful. She can't have babies. And yet, in this time, Leah bears four sons. I guess some daughters too. Daughters aren't always named. I don't know for sure. I should probably look into that a little bit more. It's kind of my job, right? Uh, but Leah bears four sons. Four sons. And we know how much sons were valued in that time. And the first one is named Reuben. His name means, behold, a son. <laughs> Check it out, a boy. It's a great way to name somebody. But she says, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. She knows that God has given her this. She, I think she kind of knew perhaps she was barren or something was wrong. And that the reason why she has a boy now is because God has opened her womb. And she says, Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Maybe now, because I've given him something of worth in our society, my husband will love me. And again, how sad that she thought her husband would start loving her just because she had a baby boy just because she was able to do something for him. And man, how many relationships and how many people's self-worth are caught up in what people say about them, what their family says about them, or what even their spouse says. And man, that they feel worthless if their spouse doesn't love them. And I get that because you want your spouse to love you. You want to be loved. You want it to be reciprocated. But as a believer, our love can't be based on that. It's got to be based on God's love. And we need to love each other whether... We're loving to, they're loving back to us. Because the Bible says that, man, the world loves those who love them. Even the world does that, so what good is it to you? You love those who hate you, who curse you. But know this, that God sees you, and God loves you, even when no one else does. Even when your dad doesn't, even when your mom isn't around, we don't say anything about our mom here. Even when your husband or wife wants nothing to do with you or just uses you for whatever Jacob was doing, sleeping with her, and he didn't love her. You know, he didn't love her, but God loved her. And they got pregnant and they had children. And again, how awkward, how demoralizing, how hurtful it must be to be in a marriage like that where you know he's out with somebody else who he really loves and he comes home to you occasionally and you have a couple kids together. Not very far from situations that happen even today. Maybe Jacob's thinking, Rachel's barren, so let me try a kids with Leah. <laughs> I didn't know the first night, so I don't think about it this night. She has another boy. His name is Simeon. It means heard, because the Lord has heard that I am hated. And God was using all this to bring Leah to himself, to show her that she did have worth, that she was beautiful to him. 
uh, from my utmost to his highest today, says, when you see a person who is close to grasping the claims of Jesus Christ, you know that your influence has been used in the right direction. And when you begin to see that person in the middle of a difficult and painful struggle, don't try to prevent it, but pray that his difficulty will grow even 10 times stronger until no power on earth or in hell could hold him away from Jesus Christ. Over and over again, we try to be amateur providences in someone's life. We are indeed amateurs coming in and actually preventing God's will and saying this person should not have to experience this difficulty. Instead of being friends of the bridegroom, our sympathy gets in the way. One day that person will say to us, you are a thief. You stole my desire to follow Jesus and because of you I lost sight of him. Beware of rejoicing with someone over the wrong thing, but always look to rejoice over the right thing. The friend of the bridegroom rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And you know that God allowed this pain in her life that it might draw her to her to himself and you know the pains in our lives that god gives us is that we might know even deeper how much he loves us if you don't feel loved by a family member or a father when you experience the love of god you will know even deeper how much he loves you even deeper because he sticks closer than anyone else in your life levi means join to and poor leah thinks well now my husband will be attached to me i've given him three sons he might not love me, but at least everyone's going to know Leah is the one that has given him three boys. Maybe we'll go out together and we won't hold hands, but at least I'll be by his side and he'll be by mine. It's sad. It is interesting, though, that Levi becomes the tribe of the priesthood. And Levi, meaning joined to, is about bringing God and man together until the Messiah comes. And God is using this awful situation in her life, this thing that broke her heart, I guarantee, daily, wore her out to be the mother of these very important and very special tribes. The next one, Judah, mean, uh, Yehuda, means praised or praise God. Jesus would come from this very tribe. This woman who was unloved, well, who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? of his mom, Leah, Jesus. And she says, now I will praise the Lord. Given a fourth son. My husband doesn't love me, but I've got a fourth son. I'm going to name him praise because God keeps blessing me. God has heard me. My husband doesn't love me. He won't ever really be associated with me. I've come to grips with that now because I've come to grips with the fact that God has loved me and I can put my worth in him. And when that happens, I want to praise him. He has blessed me. And at this point is when she stops bearing children. Because this is what God was bringing her to. No need to have more children to get the point across to Leah. She was married to God in her heart now. Didn't matter if Jacob loved her or not. Didn't matter about all the four boys in a sense to her. But she knew that she could praise God. And man, this last one, I praised you God with him. Because I was trying to praise everyone else in my life. And now trying to be joined to my husband. Trying to obey my dad. But now I praise you God. We went on the physical journey with Jacob today when he went from where he was living all the way up the coast, all the way up to Syria, to Haran. We went with him uh, as he traveled and worked for 14 years, or 21 years, technically. You know, kind of, we backtrack and talk about these things. These things probably happened in those last 7 to 14 years. But we journeyed with him physically, but we were taken on the spiritual journey of Leah. And as we close here today, let us be more like Leah. Let us be the one with the weary eyes, tired of looking at this world, tired of pleasing others, tired of living for ourselves, but look to the Lord and know that He hears us. And when we know that He hears us, we might be tired and we might not grow weary in doing good and we might praise Him. That we might have the weary eyes, but we end up with the joyful spirit of praise. And God, we do praise you, God. You're worth it. You're worthy. Thank you for looking on us, God, the ones that the world despises, God. You look on and you love. And we pray for those who haven't yet come to know you yet, that they would. And they would know how much worth they have in you. God, we ask that you'd fill us with your spirit. Help us be dependent on you and live a life of praise. And not live for the praise of man, but live to praise you. We love you, God. Come soon. Please bless all those who are listening and all those who uh, we may bump into this week. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.